In about 30 seconds, we will get started and I will do grand introductions. Okay, so we are recording today. So, and I'll, uh, I was gonna say that a little bit further on, but I will um, say that right from the outset. So if anybody needs to go back and review things, cause it's gonna be a fantastic talk, I'm without doubt. So uh, we will have the recording available. Um, I'm Richard Johnson. I'm a co-founder and partner with Ascent Employment Law. And on behalf of our firm, we want to warmly welcome you to our session on the interplay between mental health and performance management of employees. We are joined by Dr. Julia Shaheen. So she is here from the Upsilon Clinic. She's a registered psychologist and she's going to um, be taking us all through the ins and outs of how to deal with um, existing mental health issues in the context of performance management and employment at, um, of, of individuals. And so I'll be doing a, a little bi biographical information about her in a moment, but we do want to first acknowledge that we work and live on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. So uh, that includes the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. And um, we also are fortunate, just as a bit of a primer, you won't hear me drone on too long today, but as a bit of a primer, we live in exciting times and we practice employment and human rights law in very exciting times. And so one of the most impactful things that we see come up in our practice time and time again from the employment law perspective is mental health. And a lot of clients come to us saying, how do I possibly navigate employee management when I know there's an underlying mental health issue? And they approach this not only from the what can we do scenario, what is an employer allowed to do, but genuinely with concern for not making things worse for employees. So we have great clients and we're fortunate to say that they're concerned that they treat people right. And so that's another facet of, it's not just what you can and cannot do from an employer standpoint, it's actually how do I navigate this in a way that's gonna be productive for both the employee and the company and find a solution that works for everybody. Um, and that's a great, that's a great space to play in uh, for us. Um, and, that's, um, and that speaks volumes of, of the employers that are out there right now and are mindful of those issues. Um, I recently received an article from the Canadian HR reporter that touched on mental health. And I just wanna flag that as kind of an instance of how big an issue this topic is. The, the article was entitled, Claims for Mental Health Related Meds Surge in 2021. And it states a few very interesting facts. And I, I'll just go through these really quickly. In 2020, health claims for drugs used to treat depression inc increased by 10% for adults and 22% for dependents in 2020 in Canada, according to TELUS Health. More than half, 53% of workers believe their work is suffering because of poor mental health, according to another report. And overall, 56.3% of insureds so people who have insurance made a claim in 2021 compared to 62.4% before the pandemic. Um, and so we have, we have a significant issue with those numbers um, demonstrating mental health and the prevalence of mental health concerns in our workplaces. And so with that, we were, we were in need of an expert to come in and give us guidance. So we called upon the expert help of Dr. Uh, Julia Shaheen. And so she's a registered psychologist in BC, Alberta, Ontario, and has extensive experience working as a mental health professional in all sorts of settings, including primary care, hospitals, community health clinics, universities, and private practice. She is a uh, doctorate holder, and so she's Dr. Shaheen. And she has a master's of education in counseling psychology from the U of A, my uh, law school alma mater, University of Alberta, as well as a Bachelor of Science degree in, in uh, biology and psychology with honors from McMaster in Hamilton. She served as a consulting psychologist for the Copeman Healthcare Centers in Edmonton and Vancouver, which a lot of us are aware of. This is a very uh, 
very high-end name, a, a great clinic. And she's previously held an academic position at the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta. She's worked with all sorts of patients, children, adolescents, adults, couples and families providing mental health services, including di diagnostic services. And she's on the board of directors um, of the BC Psychological Association. We are in phenomenal hands today. And so with great thanks, we really appreciate you being here, Dr. Shaheen. And uh, I will turn it over to you with the brief note that we want people to find this as interactive a session as possible. And so please do, as always, put your questions or comments into the Q&A at the bottom. I'm not gonna drone on longer. You won't see me, I'm gonna turn off my video, but I will be moderating Q&A and popping on as necessary. And I can't wait to hear from you, uh, from you, Doc. And we will leave it at that. Over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. And um, thank you for the introduction and the bio. I'm just gonna see if I can share my screen here. Um, so hopefully this should work. Okay, so how's that? Is that working okay? Everyone can see this? That's perfect. perfect. Wonderful. So um, I was asked to talk about the topic of mental health in the workplace, which I have to say, it is such a timely um, topic of conversation, but it's also a huge topic of conversation. So it is going to be a little bit challenging to try and squish in as much information as possible, but I'll do my best. I figured I'll kind of really highlight some of the most important pieces um, that we know there's enough evidence and there's enough research that suggests these are some really key pieces in addressing uh, mental health in the workplace. So I'll go through some of that. Um, and as Richard mentioned, I would love for this to be as interactive as possible. The group is small enough where we can really have an interactive conversation. So I want to make sure that you're getting um, all of your questions addressed, or at least I can guide you towards some really helpful resources that will address some of the questions. I won't go through this um, in too much detail. Um, I am a registered clinical psychologist in three Canadian provinces and Upsilon Clinic does uh, offer services in all three of those provinces. And the area that I specialize in actually primarily is working with leaders, professionals, um, entrepreneurs and executives and their families. And so I kind of see the interaction of mental health in the workplace from both sides of the equation, both from the leader's perspective and the employer's perspective, but also when um, employees are going through difficulties at work. And the truth is that the vast majority of adults spend a significant number of their waking hours at work. So work can play a really significant role in people's mental health and well-being. Whether it can, people can really thrive in their workplace and feel like they're contributing and feel like that's their place of getting social connections going and they're really enjoying their time at work and it's helpful to their mental health and well-being or the flip side of that, where if things are not going well at work, or if there are stressors, or there's bullying or harassment, or some of those challenges, um, then that can also really impede their mental health and well being, or sometimes even contribute to presence of mental illness. So, work can be a place where mental illness, pre existing mental illnesses, can manifest themselves. Sometimes work can create um, mental health difficulties, and sometimes work can be really helpful for mental health. Um, so it can go in any number of directions. So the question is, how do you as employers um, or human resources really best support your employees' um, work? And I'm going to talk a little bit at, a little bit later on about how do you also care for your own mental health? Because that's also a pretty key piece in all of this. Um, just a quick disclaimer to just get that out of the way. This is not legal information. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a clinical psychologist. So I'm really only commenting on um, what we know in terms of best practices 
and what we know in terms of research about recommendations that we have good evidence and expertise to say these are really things that we see make a difference, um, but none of this is legal information. So um, I'm not really speaking about any of the legal requirements of a workplace in terms of providing mental health accommodations. Um, I'll leave that piece to the experts like Richard um, to comment on. So um, just in terms of objectives for today's presentation, I would really like to talk about a few key pieces. So um, promoting psychological safety in the workplace, and I'll explain what that means in a few moments, supporting employee success, and then managing performance concerns. Now, one of the things that I've seen um, in practice actually is oftentimes a lot of workplaces are trying to address mental health retroactively. So they're experiencing uh, an employee or a staff member that's really struggling with their mental health, or they have been diagnosed with their with a particular mental illness. And they're trying to address it once it's already come up. And I actually really want to encourage you to think about a more preventative um, set of steps that sets your workplace up for success. Because to try and do it retroactively, it's a lot more challenging. Whereas if you have more of a preventative approach, um, then the risk mitigation can also be uh, very effective. So, and I'll talk about that a little bit in more detail. So first things first, promoting psychological safety in the workplace. And I actually just a little joke in there. Um, I came across this and I thought it was quite funny. And it says, did I kill a plant or did the plant not have what it takes to thrive in this fast paced environment? And I, you know, it's a, obviously a little bit tongue in cheek, but sometimes it's also this idea that sometimes there are people that are mismatched with the particular um, job environment or the expectations of the job, but it can also be that sometimes our environments are not set up to best support um, really talented, really well-intentioned, resilient people. And we really want to find the balance between both of those things and really decide how do we address this. So let's talk a little bit about what we know so far, and Richard commented on some of this already, so thank you, Richard. But the snapshot is that currently the statistics in Canada, at least, is that about 20% or one in five people in Canada annually experiences a mental health or addictions concern or substance use disorder concern. And these numbers are actually from before the pandemic. Anecdotally, and this is not stats that backs this up, but from my own clinical practice, I would actually say that that number is a little bit higher right now. Um, but on average, we know that about 20% of Canadians annually experience a mental health concern. Um, there's some stats that suggest that by age 40, um, about half of the Canadian population has had at least one or will have experienced a mental health concern. Um, mental illness is the leading cause of disability in Canada at the moment, and we actually know that about a third of disability claims, so for both short-term and long-term disability, um, that those are mental illness related, and that actually is the 70% of disability costs for the employer. So that's really important to keep in mind because we consider mental health related concerns a a high cost driver for employers. And so that's a really important key consideration in why you really want to address mental health concerns in your workplace, because it is going to give you a return of investment by investing in some of the mental health supports, and it can hopefully reduce the amount of costs that are associated between kind of the short-term disability, long-term disability. And I'll talk about some other costs that also comes with um, mental health at the workplace. And actually about every week, approximately 500,000 Canadians uh, miss work per week. That's a pretty significant number. And the economic burden of mental illness is estimated to be at around $51 billion annually. So really kind of just the moment to pause and think about, you know, if you're sitting in your office and you're looking at, around the table and there's five people sitting there, statistically one of those individuals is struggling and the costs are very high to the employer. 
So what are some of the examples of poor, you know, costs of poor mental health? Well, we know that when people are struggling with their mental health, they're far more likely to miss work. And, um, you know, that's probably the most obvious one, but there's also some indirect direct costs to that. So if you have an employee that's missing work because of their mental health concerns, you're also, your entire team could potentially be impacted by that because if someone's missing work over and over again, that could potentially mean that other team members may have to step in, they may have to do more work, um, they really have to kind of, and sometimes that also affects the culture as well. You know, if someone's seeing that their colleagues really struggling, that might be kind of impacting their mental health as well. So there's kind of direct cost to absenteeism, but there's also some indirect cost to a team um, in terms of absenteeism. And then there's also people that do come to work when they really shouldn't. So there are a number of factors where uh, can play a role into that. Sometimes it's stigma, the people really don't feel comfortable saying, hey, I'm really having a bad mental health day, I really can't come to work. So they'll force themselves to come to work, even though they're really not in the right emotional uh, state to be doing that. So they may be present at work, but their productivity may be impacted. Um, they may, you know, I'll give you a few examples. So in depression, for example, people that are doing physical labor, uh, when they're depressed, we know that anywhere up to 20% of their physical ability can be impacted. Um, there is cognitive concerns that come up when people are experiencing various mental health issues, including depression. So for really depressed patients, they may um, have a really difficult time concentrating. They may have a really difficult time remembering things. So their cognitive performance can on average approximately 35% can be affected, particularly in more kind of moderate to severe ranges of depression. And so even if people are showing up to work because they're worried that they're going to get laid off, they're worried that there's job insecurity, um, they may not afford, be able to afford to take the time off, or um, they're really worried about stigma or what other people might think of them. Or sometimes people really feel worried that if I take the time off, how is that going to affect my colleagues? And then I don't want to burden other people by taking time off. So they'll show up even though they're really not in the right space and their productivity really suffers as a result. The next point is turnover and retention. Um, to have high turnover is actually very costly to companies. So on average, we estimate that uh, to have a staff member leave, um, that could cost the company one and a half to two and a half times their salary. And some of those costs are in recruiting and retraining new staff. And so uh, there was a survey actually recently done about asking people, you know, how often have you um, considered leaving a job or have left a job because of mental health concerns? And 20% of the respondents had actually said that they have left a previous job because of mental health reasons. And that percentage jumped from 20% to 50% for millennials and 75% for Generation Z. What that tells us is progressively the new generations are valuing their mental health and work-life balance more and more and more. And that means that they're more willing to leave a job if it's not conducive to their mental health and well-being. And so the other part of that too is, you know, it's one thing to have somebody completely leave a job, but even if you have people, staff that are thinking about leaving a job, that is also going to be costly to the company because people that have already decided or are thinking about leaving, they're far less likely to be really wholeheartedly engaged in their work. And so their productivity can suffer again. And then the last point is just basic human cost, you know, to have someone be suffering, um, of course, that's going to cost them, that's going to cost their family, that's going to affect their team members. Um, and it can have really devastating consequences. You know, we know that legal, social and economic costs in Canada related to mental health is going higher and higher. And so um, there are some devastating impacts that this can have if we are not addressing it. And I really, again, want to emphasize this more preventative approach rather than kind of a retroactive approach.
Now, I don't know if I ask a question of the audience, if there is a way that people can raise their hands, if that will show me, but I'm just curious for, for people that are in attendance, what percentage of people have um, a workplace mental health strategy in their company? Just by a show of hands, can I see that? So I see one raised hand. One, two. Okay, so that's actually a much lower number than um, we hope to see. So let me, I just lost my page here. There we go. Um, so perfect. So what do we do about this? Um, thank you for those who responded. Um, it, what we do about it is actually a few things. We're really lucky because there is there in 2013, the Commission of Mental Health Canada actually has done something that's the first of its kind in Canada and in the world actually. And they issued this thing called the Canadian National Standards on Psychological Health and Safety in the Workplace. And if you're not familiar with this resource, I strongly encourage you to have a, you know, jot this down somewhere, write it down. It's called the Canadian National Standards on Psychological Health and Safety in the Workplace. It's a free resource right now. I don't know if they're gonna start charging um, for it down the road, but right at this moment, it's completely free to access for anyone who's interested. And it's basically a very concrete step-by-step guide and benchmark that walks you through no matter the size of your organization, whether you are a small business with three employees or you're a large organization with thousands and thousands of employees, you really can adapt and modify these standards and use them in your organization to develop a comprehensive mental health strategy. So um, I strongly recommend that. Now I will summarize some of the um, key points from this, but one of the things is, well, what does psychological health and safety actually mean? Well, a workplace that promotes workers' psychological well-being and actively works to prevent harm to workers' psychological health, including in negligent, reckless, or intentional ways. So it really, again, kind of emphasizes this idea that we want to do a few things in order to in integrate our mental health strategy. One, to be very preventative, two, to have the idea of kind of how to mitigate risks should risks arise, and thirdly, to respond when you have someone that is really experiencing a mental illness or a mental health crisis during work hours. So it almost kind of tackles those three parts. So some of the recommendations is really creating an organization-wide mental health strategy. And again, I'm not gonna have time to go through all the different steps to this, but um, it's laid out in step-by-step, -step, really accessible user-friendly ways in the um, national standards. And you're welcome to kind of have a look at that. But I, I just, uh, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to note that uh, Courtney of our office put the link into the chat. So if anybody wants to look that up, it's in there. Sorry to interrupt. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, so there are some key elements in creating an organization wide mental health strategy. And the first thing that we always start with is leadership. I can share with you in my experience um, as a clinician working with both employees and employers. Oftentimes when I ask people, particularly in work settings, you know, what was the thing that allowed you or gave you kind of that internal permission, if you will, to really access help? More times than not, it, people will say that it has been um, someone that they look up to, someone that they respect or a mentor that has opened up about their own experiences, about their own struggles, um, about their willingness to support and that has often led to the other person kind of being more open to um, accessing helps even if they were reluctant or hesitant so having the leadership really engaged from the top level and committed from the top level is absolutely key 
And when we look at the surveys and the stats, actually, um, we see some stats that are a little bit uh, disheartening a little bit in that sometimes, like I think about 42% of the respondents to some of the surveys had said that they believe that their leaders are very supportive of mental health, but that they haven't done any meaningful actions to support it. And that's really important to keep in mind. You know, if we are saying the things, we got to walk the walk and we got to demonstrate that we are really committed to it. And what does that look like and how are we going to do that? Now, I'm by no means suggesting this is an easy thing to do, but really that leadership piece is really critical. And there are a lot of different ways that leaders can be engaged. And I'll talk about kind of some uh, commitment to mandatory training in a moment and what are some examples of trainings that you could potentially take on. And when I say training, it doesn't have to be this extravagant multi-day um, training, you know, even you taking this stuff today for an hour and a half is a great start. And so there are some trainings that are actually as short as three hours, but, you know, and I'll talk about some of those examples in a moment, but it's key to have leadership from the top down committed and participating in the process. Um, inclusion is really key. Uh, sometimes I hear from my patients where they say that they feel like there's you know, if they've heard or they've seen that somebody has shared about their uh, mental health to their manager or to their colleagues and have been experiencing a bit of discrimination. And that's those types of things are really, really important to kind of keep an eye out for and really ensuring that you're engaging your employees and your staff and getting that kind of feedback. You know, what are some um, barriers to people feeling included, what are some barriers to people feeling supported, and then really using that data that you've gathered and the information that you've gathered in order to implement that into your uh, organization-wide mental health strategy. And of course, inclusion is not limited to being inclusive of people with all sorts of um, disabilities. It's also inclusive of, um, are you an organization that's very supportive and inclusive of marginalized populations or minority populations? And with the understanding that sometimes marginalized populations have historically not been seen or heard. And so they may have a different set of needs when it comes to um, their mental health and their mental well-being, and they may have different barriers that they're trying to navigate. Um, the third thing is well-being, and well-being is a broad kind of umbrella term. It's beyond just mental health. So there's actually some really good research that companies that really support well-being, and that includes physical health and mental health, um, actually tend to do better in terms of productivity and return on um, investment. And so they tend to do much, much better. And we there's some really simple programs that can be really effective, you know, whether that's really supporting initiatives that encourages your staff and employee to be more physically active, um, whether that's I don't know, going for a walk during lunch hour or promoting some of those things. Now, I know some of those things are going to be a little bit more challenging in this remote environment, um, but really kind of providing those supports and really going out of your way to encourage that and be really clear about that is really key. Um, talking about job stress. So we know that people, when they experience job stress, they're far more likely to go on short-term or long-term disability um, related to mental health, and their mental health can really experience, suffer as a result of that. So it's really important for leadership to have a pulse on what are the stressors related to the specific job um, that your employee is in. So for example, are they... Um, late at night by themselves in the shop where there has been um, threats made, for example. Has there been, um, is the job a very demanding job? Has there been a lot of um, intensity and high pace that's really difficult? Is it a job that's very inflexible and the person is unable to kind of, or there's lots of demands on their time and energy. So really being mindful of what are the specific stressors that a particular job may have and finding ways to kind of mitigate that. I see a couple of raised hands, but I'm not sure how I can look at it. So if um, Richard or Victor or Courtney, if you can let me know if there's any questions popping up. 
Sure. And I'm actually just going to suggest if people have any questions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to throw them into the Q&A. And I will, I'm monitoring that and would love to hear any uh, feedback questions. And then I'll just pop back on and raise those with uh, Dr. Shaheen. That would be great. Thank you. Yep, I see a little pop-up that says that a question, a hand has been raised, but I'm not quite sure how to access it. So I'll just, Richard, I'll wait for you to just hop in whenever you need to, if you see any questions popping in. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. And so the last point is work-life balance. Now, again, um, you really wanna be mindful of different populations who have different types of responsibilities and roles that they're trying to navigate. So for example, um, a female employee who has just come back from maternity leave may be dealing with kind of navigating responsibilities at home. Or you, if you have another employee that's got aging parents and would really like to be able to provide support for their um, aging parent to go to their medical appointment and finding ways to kind of create some flexibility around that again, because when that work-life balance really suffers, then you're far more likely to have people go on um, short-term or long-term disability. You're far more likely to have people kind of have the absenteeism or presenteeism um, in those situations when there is mental health with you. Mental, their mental health is being affected or um, the stressors that between kind of navigating the work-life balance piece is really affecting their mental health and well-being and people will are more likely to kind of not show up or if they show up they're not as present or distracted etc um, and some of that could be you know being if reasonable and realistic for your particular uh, situation, potentially offering more flexibility in the scheduling or offering more flexibility in um, working from home or working remotely versus in the office and balancing some of that as well. So actually, let me pause here. Is there any questions so far? Oh, I see. Um, a question that's just popped up is how can organizations and leaders monitor mental health in a remote or work from home environment without seeming like they're prying into employees' personal lives? Um, so Richard, did you want me to answer the questions at the end? It's whatever works for you. I actually am not getting them. I think that's been the, uh, the reason that they're not coming up from my end. So I'm not seeing those. And if you prefer to address them as they come or to, um, to deal with them all at the end, that's absolutely fine. I just want people to feel invite, invited and welcome to, to raise them at some point. And I know okay, that's uh, important to you as well. So that's a great question. And actually, I'm going to come back to that one just because some of it um, I might address as I go and then I'll come back to it. And yeah, maybe it looks like we might have two different places where the questions go. So we'll kind of tally them up together. Um, so the next recommendation, I've already touched on this mandatory mental health training for leaders. Now, Experts will suggest that the mandatory mental health training for leaders, there's a few criteria for it to be effective. It does have to be mandatory. It does have to be consistent. So not, you know, just like, um, I don't know if anyone's done a first aid training, but if you're doing a first aid training, um, you, it has to be renewed every two years. So for healthcare providers, lifeguards, uh, paramedics, their first aid training has to be renewed every couple of years and similar kind of concept with mental health training. So it has to be consistent and it has to be redone every few years. Um, and more importantly, there has to be engagement. So we really want leaders to be champions of mental health um, awareness and champions of mental health in their organizations because we know the impact that that has. And so a couple of examples of mental health trainings for your leaders, and by leaders, I don't just mean um, top, top leaders like CEOs, executives, owners. It also includes um, upper management, middle management, um, basically anyone in the organization that has some kind of a leadership role. So a few examples of um, mental health trainings that I am a fan of is the mental health first aid training. Um, and it, again, it's not a multi-day long training. It's fairly accessible. You could probably do it online at the moment or the mental health awareness training. And what these trainings do is they equip you with the ability to 
identify warning signs when you're seeing an employee potentially struggling with a mental health um, crisis or a mental health concern. It also coaches you in how to address that, um, how you can have those conversations, how you can approach it. Um, if you're wanting a particular training that's a little bit more comprehensive, um, the Workplace Mental Health Leadership Certificate Program, now that is a bit of a bigger commitment, um, but you do get a certificate at the end of it. And again, it's really focused on um, not only uh, kind of educating uh, leaders about some common mental health concerns and how it can affect someone, but also what to watch out for, how to address the concerns that are coming up, how to have those conversations that can be very delicate and sensitive conversations to have, and how you can really kind of set up your workplace to navigate some of that. Um, and I'm pretty sure that these programs are fairly low cost. Um, some of them might even be free. Um, but you know, a lot of them are actually um, sponsored or funded by the government so they should be relatively accessible so if you look up you know bc government mental health first aid training you should be able to find something right away so this next piece is uh developing a customized mental health support now one thing that i find sometimes is the concept of mental health it is such a large concept and sometimes the misconception is is that one size fits all and it's a little bit like the best analogy I have for it is thinking about how do you medically support your staff? Well, medical health is a very broad umbrella and someone with a broken arm is gonna have a very different need for accommodations than somebody with um, vision difficulties versus somebody with chronic migraines versus somebody with a cancer diagnosis. And so, Mental health is such a broad umbrella term that I think it's really important to keep in mind that one size does not fit all, and it has to be kind of a customized mental health set of supports for your individual staff's needs and also your organization. Now, one thing that's really key in developing a mental health strategy for your workplace is it has to tie in and fit in with your company's vision, mission, and goals. There has to be alignment. And so we do often encourage people to kind of pause, go back to their company's vision statement, mission, and kind of goals and values, and then find that as inspiration to then align their mental health strategy. And so with that said, you know, it, then really using that to kind of assess what your particular staff's needs are when it comes to mental health. Um, and you can do that by, depending on the size of your organization, if it's small enough, you can have one-on-one -on -one conversations. If you have three people, you can potentially have a conversation with them. You know, what are your thoughts about uh, what the mental health needs of our organization um, are, or how can we best support that? Um, I see a hand up and I'm not sure if that's a new hand, <laughs> That's my, and I don't want to uh, interrupt you unnecessarily, but I had a question that came up in the chat or two questions. If we could take a moment and uh, when it's a good time and just chat about a couple of facets of this. Should I go ahead now? Absolutely. Go for it. So law is a little bit of an end. Um, it's an ancient profession. And we come at things from a legal perspective and we see all sorts of industries, but let's use law as an example. Um, sometimes we run into the old school mentality that from a manager, feelings are not my job to manage or don't bring your emotions to work. How we're seeing things change slowly and there's a lawyer's assistance program for people in the profession. And I know many other professions have the similar type of, um, type of program, but how do you break that mentality up if you're an employee in an organization? Any comments I'm, on that? I'm so glad you asked that. That's possibly one of my favorite questions actually. <laughs> Because I appreciate what you're saying, and you're right, there has been a kind of a historical mentality sometimes where there's this idea of like, your feelings are not my problem, why are you bringing it to work? 
And my answer to that, when I am asked that by people that do truly wholeheartedly believe that, and you're right, but not everyone subscribes to that, especially as time has gone on. But even if someone truly and wholeheartedly believes that, the stats and the data that we have, the evidence that we have is actually quite clear. For someone that is an owner, an entrepreneur, um, a CEO, it actually those feelings are their problem because they cost them 70% of their disability costs. A third of their short-term and long-term disability is mental health related. Mm. Their, the cost to the economy on average per year is in the billions. There's 500,000 Canadian employees that miss work every week because of it. So we can, I appreciate where they're coming from, but the truth is it is their business because it's affecting them and it's costing them dollars on a day-to-day -day basis. So really the question then becomes, we know what the data says, we know what the information is out there. And so, and for some people, maybe they're okay with that. They'll say, you know what, I just don't wanna deal with it. And therefore I'm okay to pay the costs in productivity and um, absenteeism and turnover and retention and all of that. And fair enough, I mean, there may be some legal challenges there, but from a emotional perspective that, you know, fair enough. But we actually know that when people do invest in a mental health strategy or a different type of work environment that is supportive, they're much better able to recruit and retain top talent. Um, and bottom line, it costs them a lot less money. And I'm, I love that because it's re it's one thing to be able to say, well, I, you know, it's a way of going above and beyond and being a next level employer, mm -hmm. but that gets into morality and what's good to do and right to do. And, but if you can provide the business case, and I love the way you've outlined that, mm -hmm. there's a lot of power in getting employers to see there's also a massive upside economically and from a, from a business standpoint. Can I squeeze in one more? Absolutely. Yes stigma. So I can't even count the number of times when I would be advising an employee client, an individual who comes in and I, we're talking through an issue. And the quintessential example is that they've had troubles with their manager and they feel that they're being bullied or harassed at work. Mm -hmm. And so being trying to be all encompassing as much as we can, we raise the possibility of mental health leave or a stress leave. And there still exists this really strong sense of stigma. I don't want to be that employee or that person who goes on leave because I'll be seen as weak, it's, et cetera. Can you comment on that? Because I know, I assume you've faced that. Yes. And not only have I faced that, we actually have data on this. So we know that three quarters of employees um, actually are very reluctant to share with a boss or a colleague that they're struggling with a mental health concern. And that's, those are staggering numbers. And that's actually very concerning as well, practically, because someone could be struggling and suffering, and they may not be asking for the supports that they need in order to set themselves up for success and also potentially helping out with the productivity in the situation, you know, in the company, et cetera. And so it is a real, real concern. And there are a number of variables that plays a role in that from the culture in the work environment. You know, sometimes there is stigma in some work environments, for sure. Unfortunately, they've seen a pre a another colleague of theirs that did disclose that I'm you know, struggling with depression, anxiety, whatever have you, and they have not been treated very well. And there is some really tragic actually stats out there um, in terms of some surveys that they've done where um, I don't remember the exact percentages, but a significant number of people have responded that they have not um, been promoted or they have not been offered a job opportunity after the disclosure of a mental health concern. And so, you know, there is an element of stigma that can exist. And as a result, we know that a really staggering number of people will not disclose or we would be very reluctant to disclose. 
There's also what a concept we call self-stigma that sometimes plays a role. It might not even necessarily be that the work environment is truly stigmatizing or discriminatory. It might be that those are the worries or the beliefs that the person holds themselves. Mm -hmm. And I can comment about this as a psychologist because I sometimes see, sometimes for some people, they may have so much shame around their own struggle that they're very reluctant and assume that other people must think it's a weakness if they think it's a weakness. Right. And so there's the stigma, there's the self stigma, but the, it, the bottom line is, is it's very challenging because then people are not getting the treatment that they need. They're not getting the supports that they need. And so, and their suffering may be prolonged that could affect the work culture, that could work, affect the work environment. It certainly affects their productivity and performance. So it's a very complex um, layered issue. And it's one that hopefully, I think, and that's where I really emphasize the role of leadership. If leaders are really championing this and extremely outspoken about it in organizations, it does make a difference. You know, I've had patients that have come in where they've had self stigma, but they'll come in and say, you know, my boss took me aside and said, look, I've been where you've been and I'm, I've struggled and I'll fully fund if you want to go talk to somebody I'll fully fund it and those types of steps can make such a big impact mm -hmm. and so I'm really glad that you brought that up yeah and then given the stats that you raised in terms of let's just say subsequent generations the millennials um do those stats if I'm interpreting them correctly lead lead us to think that the stigma is waning as um different generations of workers enter the workforce and prioritize mental health? Like, is that something that hopefully we're seeing broken up by uh, a different, different layer of workforce starting as well? I think so. I mean, that's more of an anecdotal thing, but I mean, I can think about when I started my practice over 10 years ago and I was seeing patients in my office, they wouldn't want to be seen coming into my office. They would look around to make sure no one's around. And then in the most recent years, it's like, I'm telling my friend about what we talked about last week and I'm posting it on social media and I saw this on TikTok. And so it's completely changed the landscape where previously I think people were so cautious about the idea of seeing a psychologist. And now they're so old, a lot more people at least are so openly talking about it and um sharing with other people kind of being in therapy and and I see this a lot more in leaders actually you know I um, am very fortunate to work with some um, leaders in Canada and there are a lot more leaders I see are much more open to discussing their doing mental health you know going for their own mental health and caring for their own mental health and their own experiences and that can have such a trickle down effect for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I've got lots more, but I will put a pin in them and I'll let you get on with it. Thanks so much for answering those questions. Absolutely. Those are great questions. I'm just going to move this over. Um, so in terms of doing the needs assessment, um, it, it also is really important to kind of figure out what are the access barriers. So why are people not accessing supports that are available? And we actually have some really interesting stats that suggest people are underutilizing their employee health benefits. Now, there are a lot of different factors that might be playing a role in that, but really understanding what's getting in people's ways would be really important in providing those mental health supports. And we already touched on this a little bit, you know, whether that's stigma, whether that's self-stigma, whether it's fears of being bullied or harassed or discriminated against if they share about um, what they're experiencing and then potentially accessing services. Sometimes it could be different populations. So for example, um, if you have workers that are doing remote work, it's gonna be much harder for them if they're kind of traveling a lot. For example, if they're doing field work, it might be a lot harder for them to access supports um, that are in person. So to you know, in Vancouver, for example, to, if they're out in North Van or somewhere else doing field work and they have to drive all the way downtown to see their psychologist, that may be really challenging. So really getting a good landscape of what are some of the barriers for them to access supports would be really important in developing your customized mental health um, supports. 
and identifying organizational gaps. And I'll comment on this in a moment, but I'll, um, this is challenging because I think large organizations have a much better ability to really customize the employee family assistance programs that they offer. Um, we know that small, small businesses have a much harder time. Um, it's just harder for them to negotiate that uh, with insurance companies. And so um, there are systemic challenges for organizations as well. And I think that's where my job as a psychologist and some of the other um, mental health organizations in Canada are really trying to advocate to the government that the government steps in and protects some small businesses in being better able to kind of negotiate some of these contracts um, so that they can offer generous employee family assistance programs to their employees in order to better support them. Um, so this, uh, this is just an infographic that I've borrowed from the Canadian Psychological Association. So the Canadian Psychological Association has partnered up with the Commission of Mental Health Canada, and they really wanted to kind of look at what is happening in the workforce as it pertains to mental health. So if you look at the top, um, only 39% of employees use their employee health benefits to access psychological services. And 80% thought that their psychological services coverage was very inadequate. Now, again, as a psychologist who does this for a living every day, I can tell you that vast majority of people, when they look at their employee health benefits, they will see that they have maybe $500 per year in coverage for a psychologist. Um, in British Columbia, Ontario, Alberta, access to a psychologist per session is anywhere from $200 and $250. So $500 of coverage is two meetings per year. That is simply, again, I can say this because I do this for a living, two meetings is about enough time for me to just do an assessment to figure out what's going on. Um, there really is not enough to provide meaningful treatment. So um, that might be a huge barrier for a lot of people where now they're having to find ways to pay out of pocket. And for a lot of people, that is a pretty significant cost. 72% um, had timely access to a psychologist within about a month, and 72% said their mental health issues improved after getting psychological services. So we have really good evidence that people, when they're able to access treatment, and by treatment, I don't just mean medication. We generally look at evidence-based psychotherapy um, and other treatments that may be specifically target it to the needs of the individual. And we have to be mindful of cultural factors. And there are a number of factors that also influences that. So for example, not all cultures are very embracing of meeting with a psychologist for talk therapy. So the services also have to be provided in a culturally informed, culturally sensitive way. And so some of your employees may need access to a different set of resources that are offered differently. So again, I'll use the field workers example. They may need access to um, virtual counseling services or virtual psychological services as opposed to kind of physically going into the office. So really kind of all of that becomes an important part of that needs assessment. And in terms of employers, about 30% increased their employee health benefits during the coverage. But look at the split between small businesses and large companies. So 54% of large companies, but only 19% of small businesses. And we think that the reason for that is that for a lot of small businesses, they have a really hard time negotiating um, their employee health packages that they offer, whereas larger companies are much better able to do that. Um, and then you can see kind of the number of sick days taken. So seven sick days taken for small, medium companies on, on average, 13 sick days um, taken for larger companies. And um, the resource for this is also in the resources section. So if you also look up Canadian Psychological Services, there's a whole article. Um, I'm not going to go through all the different details, but I just thought this was a, an interesting um, summary of what we know so far. Um, so in terms of, yeah. <laughs> Me again. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? question and I realize this may be anecdotal I'm putting you on the spot but that last slide mm -hmm. 
Let me just go back. There I'm wondering the seventh verses 13. Mm -hmm. My mind goes to my skeptic lawyer side. Okay. Thinking people may look at this and say, employees are trying to take advantage of sick time or vacation time in a large organization and fly under the radar because it's available and you won't get called out. But you can also look at it as you were saying about resources or um, having adequate care. <laughs> Do you have a sense of why the number is almost double in a larger organization? Is it, is it a matter of having supports there or pay, you know, pay coverage for people taking time off? I'm actually going to offer you a very different perspective on it. And sure. I don't have stats on this, so I can't back it up. It's just my experience. Earlier on, I talked about when people feel like they don't have job security or they are really worried about the burden they might put on other people if they don't show up. Um, and all of those reasons where even if they shouldn't be going to work, they'll push themselves to go to work. I actually have a feeling that that's the difference between small businesses versus large businesses. Okay. In a larger business, there's usually more staff that can step in. So the work is a little bit more distributed. Whereas in a smaller business, the employee may really feel like they're burdening, you know, the, and Jody that's sitting across from them. And so they may pressure themselves to go to work even if they're not prepared. There's more jobs insecurity in usually in small businesses versus larger businesses. So they might in fear of um, potentially losing their work, they might push themselves to go to work even if they're not able to or ready to. And so I actually, and I say this anecdotally because I have these types of conversations with people all the time where they're really in small organizations, they're worried, well, you know, I, it's just me, my boss and Aunt Jody. I'm picking on Aunt Jody, whoever. Absolutely, Aunt Jody. sure. Yeah. But it could be three people, the whole organization is three people. So they're that much more aware of the burden that that might put on other people. So they'll push themselves to go to work anyways, or they may worry about, you know, such a small organization, like I might lose my job. Um, and so I actually have a feeling it might have more to do with that. Um, now, granted, I'm a psychologist. I am trained to always see the best in people. So I'm not saying that it, you know, your possibilities don't exist. I'm sure they do, but that would be the best explanation that I can come up with based on my personal experiences as a clinician. I love it. And I would say that that dovetails quite well with experience in law and what we see being the dynamics in small versus larger business. So great. I just thought I'd ask. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm glad you did. Thank you. So um, let's see, I'm just gonna move this out of the way. Um, so the next recommendation is, you know, once you've done your needs assessment, once you've engaged leadership, you've done the training, um, you've customized your mental health supports, really assessing outcome and building accountability. And one thing that I always say um, is, it's really, really important to not just building accountability by leadership, but also building accountability by the staff and the employees. The more engaged they are in the process, the more, um, the better the outcome. And you can actually track key performance indicators and collect that data and key performance indicators that you can include to kind of as a, as a way of measuring it is, you know, um, do you have people go on short-term disability for shorter periods of time? What are the sick days like? Has there been a change in the number of sick days? Um, have you had better ability to transition successfully people from long-term disability back to work? What has been the return of investment on the mental health supports? What's happening with the duration of long-term disability? So these are all several key performance indicators that you can use um, within your organization to collect that information and, and data. And I think this goes without saying, but I just thought I'd include it just in case. 
In terms of mental health and well-being and in the spirit of being very preventative, risk mitigation, um, and then responding to mental illness at the workplace, I think it's also really important to really keep an eye out for systemic challenges within the culture of the company. You know, is there issues around harassment? Is there issues around bullying? Is there issues around systemic discrimination? Um, do some people get a lot and other people, you know, there's a bit of injustice in kind of accessibility to certain supports and resources? Um, is there any um, particular kind of conflicts that have not been resolved? Is there any other types of discrimination that you want to kind of address or be mindful of? And the next piece, and I'll talk about this kind of a little bit more anecdotally, actually, I would really, not just me, we encourage companies to really prioritize return to work process. Return to work process, in my experience as a psychologist, has generally been to a large extent left to the treating clinician. Um, so whether that's a physician or a psychologist or an occupational therapist or whoever's working with the employee, where they may write a letter and say, you know, please support this person to return to work. And oftentimes workplaces are a little bit unsure. Well, like, how, how do we do this? How do we get this person back to work? And the reason why prioritizing this process is really important is there's a real risk if you have an employee that's gone on leave and they're coming back too early or they're taking on too much too fast, then you could potentially risk having them go back into another stint of short or long-term disability. Um, and more importantly, the more damaging piece maybe to that is then that might really affect their confidence and it can really make it that much harder for them to come back. So really prioritizing this process and being really supportive and sensitive as much as possible in that process is really key. One suggestion that um, we often have, because there's some really good evidence that says when companies invest, when they're able to, when they invest in occupational health professionals to check in regularly with employees that are on leave, they actually have a fairly good ROI, return on investment. And so we know that people that are being checked in on by occupational health therapists through their organization um, tend to come back to work a little bit faster, and they tend to be a little bit more successful in their process of trans transitioning back. So that might be something to consider as a potential investment. Um, and then really in terms of supports in place, you really want to be mindful of, you know, uh, we talk a lot about gradual transition back to work. So if someone's been on a leave for two years, probably starting full time, nine to five every single day, it, it's not going to set them up for success. So really being mindful of the customized return plan. And I can't emphasize this enough. The employee has to have a really key role and say in that process. You know, we say this even in my profession, I always say to people, to my patients, you know, I'm not an expert in your life, you are the expert of yourself, yourself and your life. So they would know better um, what their needs are than somebody else making a guess. So really kind of making this a very collaborative process with them. If they're comfortable having their healthcare professional involved in that process, you certainly can have the involvement of the healthcare professional and really kind of implement some of their suggestions as well. Um, for them to have access to mental health support. So I'll share with you a few examples of how critical that is. So um, I work a lot with uh, several professional populations, one of those being the RCMP. Sometimes what happens is, whether it's the organization or the employee, and in the example that I'm about to share with you, it was actually more the employee, they were so focused on kind of getting to a place where they were in a good mental health space that they could return back to work because they loved their job, they were so passionate about their job, they wanted to go back to work. They had put so much emphasis on that piece that they had forgotten to kind of really think about what that transition process is going to look like and whether they will, they've set up kind of mental health supports for themselves during. And so I think it's really, really key for organizations to keep in mind that the 
while they're on leave, they need access to mental health supports. But that transition piece can be really challenging as well. And they really, it's critical for them to also have access to mental health support should they want and need it um, during the period of transition and then after until there's a sense of stability before we kind of phase out. So really ensuring that that's available. Um, and like I said, modifying the job and the job's expectations, whether that's the content of the job or the pace of the job or the number of hours or whatever is needed in that situation to really kind of set the person up for success. Um, and them having a sense of autonomy is really uh, key in that process as well. So this is, I'm not going to go into this uh, because it's a this is all laid out in detail in the national standards for psychological health and safety, but I just wanted to show you um, the, the kind of pillars to your workplace mental health strategy. We've kind of touched on some of these things. So having programs and programs, like I said, regardless of the size of your organization, um, you can have massive company-wide workplace awareness campaigns if you have a company that hires thousands and thousands of people, or you can have a small peer support group where you're partnering up a struggling employee with someone that is really emotionally intelligent and supportive and encouraging and really effective at kind of doing the job where they can provide a bit of a mentorship and support role. Um, and there are lots of really great resources that you can access through the Mental Health Commission of Canada. They have lots of, I think they call them workplace strategies toolkit where they have these like one to two page long specific things. And I'm going to show you an example of that about what to do when you have a specific employee that's really having performance issues. Um, but they have that for lots of other topics as well that you can have a look at. Um, it talks about some policies. It'll talk about benefits. And again, with benefits, one other thing I'll just mention as well is not only do you want to be really aware of what it is that your benefits package provides, you really want to understand kind of what that entails. So for example, as I mentioned, um, some will provide anywhere from $500 of coverage per year for psychologist services. And then some companies will offer $10,000 a year, which is fantastic. Um, but then also some, some places don't necessarily offer a specific dollar amount for psychologist services. They may offer a general kind of employee assistance program where the person can call in to a phone number um, and access a counselor or a therapist. And really understanding kind of what is actually offered through those programs and is that matching up with the needs of your um, employees? Because as you saw a little bit earlier, if vast majority of employees feel that their coverage is inadequate. It might be that you're throwing a lot of money at these employee assistance programs and it being a bit of a mismatch with what it is that an employee may need. So just one example of that could be, um, let's say an employee has access to counselors and therapists through their EAP program, but let's say that they have a very severe form of obsessive compulsive disorder. Does the EAP provide the specialty and the specialization and the skills level that is required for that specific diagnosis? And sometimes the answer to that is yes, and sometimes the answer to that is no. So really kind of getting a good grasp of what, you know, what are you offering and what does that mean? Um, and is that a good match for what your staff needs? Um, and then we talked a little bit about training. We talked a little bit about the assessment. There are a number of really fantastic assessment tools um, in trying to assess kind of what your organization's needs, access barriers, et cetera, are. Um, and those are, again, all free resources that any organization can use. Um, and they just have a few examples on there, but you can find them through the Commission, Mental Health Commission of Canada as well. So I won't go through supporting employee success in too much detail because that's a whole separate talk all on its own, but I will just cover a resource that I think is really helpful. So the, the resource is a PDF workbook and you can access it through the link here or you can access it through again, um, it's called Workplace Strategies for Mental Health and they have a number of resources. And what I like about it is it's a very step-by-step, -step, but probably the piece of it that's for me as a psychologist is my favorite piece 
is it really honors the employee's confidentiality. So it's not asking for a diagnosis. It's not asking for like what the person's symptoms are. It really focuses on the functionality of the job. So for example, what are the you know, cognitive demands of this job? Is it a very structured routine job or does it require cognitive flexibility? And you can go through this with your um, staff or employee and really kind of go through its checklist. So you can go through together, you know, what are the areas where they may need some adaptations to the work or um, they may need some supports in place in order to meet the specific functions and demands of the job. Now, there are some really key important factors for this to be successful, and those are all laid out really well in this particular um, resource. So I'm not going to go through them one by one, um, but it is fantastic. If, you, if you're meeting those criteria, then it can be a really fantastic resource to really help maintain a productive work environment that also is psychologically safe, because then you're not getting into the sensitive conversation about, well, what is your diagnosis? Well, I don't really want to share with you what my diagnosis is. Oh, these are my symptoms. And it just kind of creates a little bit more complexity um, that can be really uncomfortable for both parties involved, whether you're the leader or the manager having that conversation or the employee that is feeling uncomfortable kind of sharing some of that. So it's very focused. It talks about what are the physical implications or functions? What are the limitations? These are the cognitive stressors. What are the limitations and expectations? And it's a very kind of solution focused as well. So you can have a look at that and um, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about it. So an important note, and this is probably a particular topic that I feel quite passionate about, which is in order for you to set up an employee for success, first and foremost, you as the person in the position of leadership or human resources, the person is providing the support, you absolutely have to care for your own mental health and well-being. I have to say the number of times I've seen people in position of leadership where they're really struggling themselves on the inside, but they're feeling this pressure or expectation to be the rock for everybody else or feel like, well, I have to put up this joyful, cheerful presentation so that I don't feel like I'm discouraging my staff. And, and that almost causes this extra layer of complexity. And so I just wanna walk you through a very, very quick exercise here. And I just want you to take a moment and you don't have to answer me this. I just want you to think about this. Think about the last two weeks for you. Did you get good quality sleep and a good number of hours of sleep? Just answer to yourself, yes or no. Was your sleep interrupted, disturbed a lot of the times, rarely, or some of the times? Think about your nutrition. Has your appetite shifted quite a bit? Have you been eating a lot less or really going to town with a bit of comfort or emotional eating? Have you been feeling really down or low or really stressed or anxious? Have you been feeling so overwhelmed that you're just not sure where to start? If you've answered any of those questions as a yes or a lot of the times or answered several of those as sometimes, I really encourage you to kind of take a moment and pause and do a bit of a pulse check with yourself and go, am I in the best place of well-being and wellness as I can be? Because I can tell you that when people are burnt out, when people are struggling with their own mental health and well-being, they have a lot less patience for other people. So it's a lot harder to support an employee if you are kind of just hanging by a thread yourself or um, your own attention span and distractibility is going to be affected. Your own work performance is going to be affected. And because I work a lot with leaders, I, I see that 
there is these expectations and pressures that sometimes leaders are, are under. You know, not only are you caring for yourself and your family, but you're also caring for all these other people and taking on all of their stuff as well. So it's a really, really, really important to keep an eye out for your own mental health and well-being and being really intentional and purposeful about caring for yourself. So I just want to kind of put that out there and, um, you know, don't be the person sitting in a house under fire and saying, oh, it's fine. Everything's peachy. Um, so I figured I'll spend the last little bit uh, kind of chatting a little bit about um, managing performance as well. So Richard, may I? Of course. As you were talking through something hit me, we sometimes get used to um, the advent or the use of certain phrasing without really unpacking it. And so I was just wondering if you have a kind of an everyday explanation of psychological safety. So we hear that talked about a lot. What does that mean to you as somebody in this field um, where we can come at it and ensure a few things that will provide this psychological safety that's so important. So my definition of it for individuals is a little bit de different than kind of the definition that we use for organizations. So the definition that we use for organizations is the one that I shared a little bit earlier on, which is really borrowed from the national standards. Mm -hmm. um, but for an individual, how I think about it is Psychological safety for an individual, typically, at least from my perspective, is that they feel relatively accepting of themselves and their circumstances as they are, without this constant fear or threat, a sense of threat that something needs to change immediately. So. Mm. Think about someone who's struggling with depression, for example. They may feel a sense of threat that they're so hopeless or they're so um, disengaged from their lives that they're really not comfortable in their own skin in that moment. And so that is not a psychological kind of safe healthy place to be in. Someone with an anxiety disorder may experience a similar thing. Now, one thing I will say is there is a difference and we differentiate between mental illness and mental health. So someone could be very mentally well and have a mental illness. So they can have mental wellness with a mental illness versus someone that um, may not have a mental illness but may also not have mental wellness. So we do separate that. You know, someone that has depression, if it's been relatively treated, it's relatively stable, they're actually comfortable. They're accepting of themselves and the circumstances as is, and they're able to manage all the things that they need to manage. So they may have reached the point of having mental wellness despite having a diagnosis of a mental illness. So I'm really glad you brought that up because I do wanna make that distinction that many people with mental illnesses live very fulfilled, thriving lives right. because they're in a place of stability and they're in a place of acceptance with where things are at and their illness is relatively well managed. And so it's, it's really about kind of that psychological state that they're in as it relates to themselves and their circumstances. Oh, great insight. Thank you. That's an important distinction, I think. Hey? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for asking my question. All right. So um, managing performance issues. Now, you know, for me as a psychologist, this um, may sound like a very psychologist thing to say, but I actually really strongly encourage leaders to come at it from a place of compassion, give people the benefit of the doubt, because we know that when people feel a little bit targeted or attacked, even if that's not your intention, you know, they respond in a little bit of a defensiveness. And if they're feeling defensive or their guards are up, 
you're actually not engaging in a meaningful conversation. That's not exclusively related to leaders and employees. I mean, the same concepts apply between parents and children, friends and friends, and romantic partners. So even think about um, you know, a relationship in your own life, whether it be a romantic relationship or a relationship with a child or a parent, if you kind of come at it from the place of, well, you're never home on time, or how could you possibly do this? You've already lost the conversation. It's going to escalate. It's going to be heated. It's not going to go well. Whereas if you're able to kind of come at it from a place of compassion, and this requires the you or you, the people in position of leadership to be well themselves and to be in a good place of mental health for themselves to have the patience and ability to come at this with uh, compassion. Um, it really sets the conversation for success and it sets the tone in a very different way. So really kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt, approaching it with empathy and kind of talking about really specific examples. So rather than saying something like, um, you're always late, that again, that could you could really easily lose that person. Whereas saying, you know, on Monday and Tuesday, I noticed that you were running a little bit late. What's going on? Is everything okay? When you open it up like that, you're giving really specific examples. So you're not generalizing to who that person is. Um, and it also pre provides an opportunity for them to provide a bit of context that might explain, I'm really sorry, Monday, Tuesday, my child was throwing up and I really had to care for them before I came to work. And so once that context is provided, and I wanna clarify, Providing context does not mean that the behavior is acceptable, the behavior may not be acceptable, but the context provides an opportunity for collaborative problem solving. And so I think that that context is really important. So then you can collaboratively then come up with some solutions and be open minded to some of the suggestions that they might have. So for example, if they say, you know, when we have these six meetings a day it really makes it harder for me to then refocus my attention onto the emails that I'm sending. It would be so helpful if I could skip a couple of those meetings a day so I can really focus on my work. If that's a suggestion that's doable for your situation, your organization, and it's going to refocus them and help them better succeed, then it's certainly worth kind of exploring that. And then you can implement some of those suggestions that you've collaboratively come up with, give it a trial period, and then check in together and go, you know, how effective was it? Did it work? Did it not work? Et cetera. Um, we talk a lot about if possible, and again, I'm very mindful that some of this is a little bit easier in larger organizations than small organizations, but if you're able to provide um, additional training or professional development opportunities, so you know, if someone's having a really difficult time with conf conflict management, is there ways that they can attend a workshop or you can recommend a book for them if they're open to kind of reading it or whatever have you that helps them with conflict management skills or um, helps them with better writing emails or um, improves their public speaking or whatever have you. And then another option that's maybe a little bit lower cost is partnering up, up with a mentor. So another um, team member that's really good at what they're doing, but also is emotionally intelligent. I think these are things that you wanna approach in a very sensitive manner. So um, just partnering up somebody with another person's really good at the job, not really good at the human side of things may not be the best, but really finding someone that's really capable of providing that in an encouraging, supportive way would be fantastic. And then lastly, documenting the progress. So um, after the feedback, training, coaching, following up regularly, documenting everything, and more importantly, celebrating the wins. I think this is one that's easily missed. And we can often, because we're in that problem solving mode, we can often say, well, you know, we sent you off to learn about conflict management, but you just fought with Billy last night. Like, what was that about? And really kind of, you know, in the last two weeks, we've really noticed that you've actually had really managed some of these conflictual situations much more often in a, in a really positive outcome than before. So well done, really kind of celebrating those successes and noting the examples of the improvements, the efforts and the successes so that you can build their confidence up and you can really kind of reinforce some of those successes and progress. 
Um, I have a list of resources here. I've mentioned all of them so far. Uh, Commission of Mental Health Canada is a great place to start. Um, they have links basically to all the other resources as well. So if you want to start with that, that's a great place to start. And then there's some references. And then I think the last piece is any other questions. I'm sorry, I was just looking through our Q&A, our chat. Um, I have three questions if I could fire them at you in rapid succession. Okay, now uh, I just wanna double check. We have five minutes? Yes, if that's okay for you. Yes, absolutely. So the first question that comes up is, um, when somebody is returning from work, or uh, from a, uh, returning to work from a, a leave, a medical leave, what are some signs to watch for that they're slipping back? And I, I apologize if my terminolo terminology is indelicate here, but let's say they're going back into what you had previously identify as uh, perhaps uh, an onset of, or a recurrence of a mental illness episode mm -hmm. or mental, um, but they're not, there's not well being at the point in time. How do we identify that? Or how do we identify that perhaps they're not in a very um, sustainable state of affairs mentally? So, typically, in general, when we look for um, warning signs, if you will, we really look for significant changes to the person's previous functioning. That for a lot of um, mental health concerns, that's something that we look for. So for example, someone that has historically been consistently coming on time and really kind of taking care of their hygiene and things like that. And now all of a sudden they're coming in a lot more often, like late a lot more often, or there's been a significant change. That often is a really good sign that something's going up. So any significant behavioral or personality changes from their previous functioning. Now with someone that's returning from leave, um, it's a little bit different because you haven't seen them in a while. So it's, it's harder to establish that kind of previous functioning, right. even if you're noticing a change from week one to week two. So week one, they came in, they were a lot more energized, they were a lot more eager, they were a lot more talkative, they were a lot more um, engaged in tasks. And then week two, as the number of hours have gone up, or as the responsibilities have gone up, um, they're starting to really struggle with deadlines, they're starting to struggle with, you know, whatever. So even if there's changes from in that gradual return process, as the demands of the job are increasing, or as the number of hours are changing, if you're noticing significant changes in some of those things, that might be a really good warning sign to, to check in. And that's why I think I really emphasize the prioritizing the return to work process, because that is a very delicate time for people. And it's a time where that transition to work has to be managed. And so those regular check-ins are critical. Okay, that's perfect. Can I ask you an age old debate at, in our legal employment law bar? Sure. <clears throat> it may not be a, a debate amongst lawyers these days as much as it used to be, but what day of the week <clears throat> is most appropriate from a mental health perspective to deliver quintessentially it's a termination, but let's say that we're not getting to that point, but we're delivering hard news, we're having tough conversations. Our approach generally at Ascent is that you would watch out for Fridays and not do it on a Friday for, for fear that they can't get counseling over the weekend and they'll sit to stew over things. Right. But do you have any comments on that? What day of the week might be more appropriate for delivering tough news? That is such a tough question because my, uh, my first honest reaction is there's then going to be a good day. Yeah, yes, I mean, fair. Like, just, bad news is bad news. So yeah. is there truly going to be a, a good day? But I, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness around um, maybe limitations and access to resources should the person want it. If the, the message is delivered at the end of the day, that could be a little bit tricky because then they might not be able to access things after hours or the weekends. But I don't know that, you know, Aside from that, I, I can't think of whether Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is going to be any better 
then. And ultimately, I mean, it's a little bit like, what's the best day to break up with somebody? That's fair. Not Valentine's Day. Fair enough. Yes. Or their birthday. But yes, no, fair, <laughs> fair comment. Absolutely. Yeah, fair enough. But it's a, it's a great question. And I don't know. I don't have a good answer for it. Okay. But perhaps validity maybe to the Friday issue if they can't get counseling yes. services. Yeah, I think that's very thoughtful to kind of be mindful of that. Although, it, you know, to realistically, I mean, can people get an appointment right away anyways? Right. Um, if, you know, if, even if it's Monday morning, I mean, what are the odds of them being able to get an appointment like Monday afternoon or Tuesday? But I think it's still a really, uh, it's still very thoughtful. And so, yeah, it's a fair point. Okay. This, I'm just noting the time, it's 1.30 on the nose. This has been immensely valuable. Thank you, Dr. Shaheen. So um, you have provided your contact information in the slides, which I believe we can share with the audience yeah. members. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It is such a big topic and, and I'm sure there's tons and tons of questions that we didn't get to. So if anyone has any other questions or if they wanted to do part two of this talk or a different one for their organization, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is on the, uh, the slides. It's also on the website. And um, thank you so much for having me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You as well. Thanks so much. Take, sure. take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.